Hey there, welcome to the tall and the short of it. It's just me, Jenny, <laughs> today. Oh yeah, I'm gonna turn that on. That's a little better, actually. Mm -hmm. And I have a special guest today. Hi, I'm Christina Douglas, occupational therapist. Yes, so we have been talking about related services this month. Well, let me just claim this. I've had an epic fail this month <laughs> with getting <laughs> online <laughs> this month. Hey, Betsy. Uh, Betsy's joining us. Um, hey, Jake is joining us to comment and, and join the conversation because um, <laughs> she, she can't find her AirPods and uh, we won't be able to hear her if she tries to come on with us. So she's just gonna be in the comments for us today, but I'm sure she'll participate. Um, so get on there and, and talk back and forth with her. Um, but yeah, we've been doing um, related services this month as our theme. We started with transportation and then we tried to get a PT and that didn't work out. <laughs> And then life got crazy, and then we did the vendor event last weekend, which was really great for support the educators and the educator connection. And now we're doing OT before the Yay. Thanksgiving break. So, how was your day today? Did you have a good, good. day? Yes. Yeah. I'm off work this week. So Woohoo! Very good. Yay. Well, I just finished today, so I actually get the <laughs> next few days off. So I'm excited. We were rushing around super oh, sure. fast trying to get everything done so we could go on time. So that's a good thing. I'm sure. All right, so tell us, Christina, what is an occupational therapist or what is occupational therapy? Okay, so this is commonly misunderstood. People think that as occupational therapists, we work with individuals to get them back to work. That's not all we do. So mm -hmm. occupations are how you occupy your time, those meaningful and purposeful activities you do in a day, like getting dressed, um, for children specifically, play, self-care skills, school, um, things like that. So we work with individuals on being able to get back to those activities or begin them if they didn't have the skills to do so in the first place. Okay. So a lot of times, um, when do we, when do you typically see those delays start in kids if they're going to have delays? Oh, it can start. Usually it's say around six months when they start hitting motor milestones. If they're not, you know, rolling by six months or starting to try and get in to sit, then we start to see motor delays then and we know we've got to do early intervention services. Okay, okay. So how is school OT, because schools do provide occupational mm -hmm. therapy as a related service in an IEP, but how is that different from like an occupational therapist that your doctor <laughs> might send you to, so that medical-based? Yeah. So in medical-based, we can address anything relating to those meaningful and purposeful activities that I talked about. But in school-based OT, we only address the skills needed for them to be able to participate in um, the education setting, so the occupation of education. Or in some special ed settings, that can include self-care for um, your mm -hmm. classrooms that focus on those skills. But okay. we don't address, like, typically um, sensory issues unless it affects excuse me, the school setting or um, I've had parents that have wanted me to work on feeding in the school setting. Well, feeding's not been impaired in the school setting. It's more outside of school, so then that would be more your clinical-based therapies. Gotcha. Um, so a lot of handwriting. Hey, Kristen. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> a lot of handwriting. Handwriting's a big referral in school-based OT. Um, that seems mm -hmm. to be when most people notice that there's motor delays is when their handwriting's terrible. Mm -hmm. um, attention issues. I think what else? I've, Sensory issues. When they say they can't hold their pencil correctly yes. or their scissors or poor pencil grasp, difficulty cutting, gluing. So when you start to see, usually for OT, the referrals when the um, educators see fine motor deficits. Okay. Kristen and Betsy, feel free to add in or ask questions. As yeah, well. absolutely. You guys know tons about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been dealing with this for a while. So. Um, how, what does that look like when you give occupational therapy in a school setting? Okay. So, you want me to start from getting from eval to... Sure, okay. sure, yeah. So, when we get a referral, we have... It's 50, right? It's <laughs> 50 school days. 50 yeah. school days. I've been all over several different settings lately. Um, to complete the evaluation and case conference to determine what services um, in terms of OT, if are warranted but based on the committee's decision. And then how it looks different is if a child qualifies for OT services. Um, in an outpatient setting, you'll get anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes a week usually. In school-based, it's usually not more than 20, 30 minutes a week. 
Uh, and the idea behind that is I'm as a therapist only there one time a week, so I'm not going to make a big difference uh -huh. um, seeing that child one time a week in the school setting. So my job is to really work on collaborating with the educational team and giving them ideas and strategies to reinforce when I'm not there. Right. So that we have better um, outcomes and consistency throughout versus so, relying solely on So more sources. modeling for the yes. classroom teachers and maybe the aides and uh, the other people that are working with the children on mm -hmm. what things they should be doing throughout the whole yes, week. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So that's completely different from a medical or clinical yeah. model, right? Yeah. Well, we do in the medical clinical model collaborate with parents and caregivers, um, but it's, again, because the duration is shorter in the school setting and the, ch the child usually has some sort of team around them, whether it be gen ed, special ed teacher, mm -hmm. paraprofessionals, um, you know, specials, speech therapy, other related disciplines, mm -hmm. whatever, we can collaborate more and have a team-based approach, I feel like, in the school setting. Sure, yeah, and so. that makes sense. Um, so it could look like where you pull that student out and work with them, mm -hmm. and it could also look like pushing into the classroom, right? Yes, so ideally it's least restrictive environment, which means that we try to push in, as you know, as mm -hmm. much as possible. Um, but if a child really needs pull-out services, we can do that and bring them out. So. I do a lot more pull out with like my kids that need sensory interventions and sensory strategies for mm -hmm. the classroom because some of that's trial and error and it's disruptive to try and do that in the classroom and mm -hmm. I can take them to a sensory room and do that. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, whereas if it's things I'm wanting to model for the teacher to push in or do in small group is easier because then I'm there in the classroom and can actually model what I want the teacher or the paraprofessionals or whomever to do with that child. Okay. So combination of both usually awesome well hey Kristen that was a huge comment I have to press the C more <laughs> I love um, it wait, that's, oh wait that's Betsy, Betsy. <laughs> sorry we got two comments there carry over during the school day is yes. vital love the team-based approach yes yes and I often find what is development appropriate doesn't always match what is expected especially at the younger levels so yeah. do you mean like the teacher wants more than what or is thinking they should be doing more than what they're doing or what what do you mean by that oh oh I, I think I know what she means like what's development appropriate for a kindergartner to do the teachers think they should be they doing do more than that so that's, that I think that's what you meant right yeah well yeah. we're waiting for a response I'll get on a whole <laughs> soapbox here. okay okay so and that often happens so developmentally for example, children often aren't ready to start handwriting till towards the end of age six because for pre-writing skills, you want them to be able to make vertical, horizontal lines, across a circle, and a triangle because those have all the different mm -hmm. lines you need to form letters. And developmentally, it's still within what's considered normal for a child who's six to still be working on forming a triangle. But oftentimes, we're pushing handwriting in preschool mm -hmm. now. And developmentally, they're not, they don't have the motor skills yet. And so then we get referrals because, well, this child can't form an A. Well, they can't draw a triangle. So mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to form an A yet. But we're getting the referral because now this, the, and that's a whole other soapbox that's, I'll let mm -hmm. you save that soapbox <laughs> for you, where the standards are for them to be able to do these things earlier and motor skill wise, they're not ready yet. So, yeah. Hey, Terry. So, um, okay, yeah, that, that's definitely <laughs> the case as far as, like, they'll tend to refer sooner than what mm -hmm. we, what, and I don't think, I think it's because, um, and I do know Indiana has very high expectations yes. for kindergartners compared to national norms. Yes. So, that's another issue is that um, even if you think they're behind and you make a referral, they won't typically qualify mm -hmm. um, unless they're extremely behind absolutely so um that's and and i think that's a frustration sometimes to parents and teachers yes. is they're like well he needs help and it's like well then work with him yes you know it's not necessarily an occupational therapy no. issue it's more of a he just needs more practice yes and sometimes it's a lack of um exposure to like for example developmentally kids at age three should be able to snip paper with scissors well i'm not going to give a three-year-old a pair of scissors and just let them cut. So oftentimes, even in the clinic or school and like preschool, I'll see kids who have delayed cutting skills. Well, it's because they haven't been exposed to using scissors very often because as parents, we're not going to just give our children scissors. So then it's educating um, the caregiver to uh -huh. do that su as a supervised activity to promote that skill. So Gotcha. Gotcha. So I know that we also provide occupational therapy at the secondary level a lot mm -hmm. of times for our kids with life skills yes. issues or 
Um, sometimes if we've had a kid with a traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, how does your role change as the student gets older? So typically in the earlier settings like K through two and even three or four, we tend to do more um, intensive intervention services because we're still in that kind of window of time where developmentally the brain is still so um, dynamic and can change very easily and those motor maps are not hardwired. So we tend to try and do more direct services there. But when they start to get to, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way up through high school, the focus changes from trying to remediate to, okay, let's adapt, modify, use what we, the strengths we have and take a strengths-based approach and also kind of come in more as a consultant and let the students start to advocate for themselves more mm -hmm. um, and take some ownership themselves. And so then in that role as a consultant, still heavy collaboration with the educational team, but a lot of times the children I see, that or children, teens even at that age, um, it's them more taking ownership, being able to speak up for their needs, um, being able to, I'll meet with them usually. So in the consultant model, I'll meet with the student. I've had students even because as a related service, we tend to stand out. We don't, you know, other kids notice when we come in the classroom that we're mm -hmm. not the regular teacher. So I've even had students say, hey, can you send a hall pass and have me come to the office and not come get me directly? Mm -hmm. um, just a side note. But when they um, come, I meet with them and we discuss, you know, what's going well, what's not, discuss their accommodations, um, any issues they may be having. And then I go and talk with their teachers uh, and talk with anybody else that's related that needs mm -hmm. to know what's going on and uh, address those. So some of the things we've done is like um, talk to text type stuff on the iPad. Like I've had students who are fatigued or have poor handwriting. In high school, that's really not going to change. So we're focusing on typing or talk mm -hmm. to text type software. Um, taking pictures of assignments on the board because they can't scribble them down fast enough or they can, but they can't read mm -hmm. it later. Uh, so then it's more of a problem solving approach with them and giving them some ownership of their educational goals as well and having them be a part of that process of finding what works best for them too. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And so, and, and, and also when the, when teachers at the secondary level are cr trying to create like transition assessments mm -hmm. and, um, things for what this child might do for a yes. job. I think that's a really yes. great time to consult Absolutely. with the occupational therapist about what skills should I be teaching mm -hmm. this student. Um, it might be even helpful to consult with your OT about what types of goals would be appropriate yes. for working. Like what what base skills will this child need to be able to get to this type of job that yes. he wants? And then how can we structure those in the day? And mm -hmm. so a lot of times the OTs will, and not that educators don't do this again, there's a lot of overlap across mm -hmm. all disciplines, but um, OTs have a unique skill set that we can look at the routine throughout the day and try and figure out where we can build that in without mm -hmm. trying to disrupt the classroom and all the work that the teachers are doing in the classroom. And I'm a really big advocate too. So for example, in terms of employment skills, I've worked with a lot of high schoolers that they're trying to do some pre-employment stuff, finding things that are meaningful and purposeful and don't just fill time. Like, right. um, you know, whether it be delivering paper reams to the printers and the copiers, or I've had students do coffee carts and go around the mm -hmm. school and do that. And they then have, you know, the task of not only making the coffee, but then raising the money for in mm -hmm. some way for something. Um, but not just something that has no meaning behind sure. it whatsoever. I've seen like some of that some of the tasks that the the kids have done is like to roll silverware into napkins yes. and use them for the cafeteria mm -hmm. for breakfast in the morning. Absolutely. Or you know, put a ketchup and salt packet with a mm -hmm. you know for for different things. Or they'll. Um, I know some of our kids. I think in the district I'm at now, they work in the food, like getting yes. ready for the food pantry, getting mm -hmm. all the things organized and things like that. And I have one at a school system I was at. She was, I think it was her senior year in the library. She worked kind of as an assistant librarian, checking the mm -hmm. books in and out, and things like that. <laughs> I can't take total credit for that. That's also Kristen. So. Yes, yes, <laughs> Kristen's coffee cart. That was awesome. So, for sure. Um. So. And I, I, I didn't prep you for this particular You're question. Fine. <laughs> you wrote another long one. Actually, yes. High school looking at other options. Yes. Yeah. So really, and I'm not going to say at the high school age that development or that they're not going to gain new skills. They can, but at that point, the brain, 
is it's developed the motor map so it's really hard to change handwriting it's really hard to change grasp mm -hmm. really hard to get some of those skills so then again it's yeah using that strength based approach what can we use and then also what can we adapt and modify to make it work for them absolutely um so like i said i didn't really prep you for this That's question okay. but i know Go that a it. lot of times um in school models you may co-treat with a pt yes so what is what is what what is the purpose and what why would we do that? Um, so PT, um, and if any of my PT friends are watching, and I totally butcher this, I'm sorry. Physical but, therapy, by the way, <laughs> physical, for my layman people. <laughs> um, <laughs> physical therapy really uh, works on gross motor skills and mobility and safety and getting around the school uh, building and like for example steps or balance and being able to get on the playground, which OT does as well. So when we co-treat. A lot of times we're co-treating because we have a child that we have their motor skills overlap what we both need. Like, so if I have a child who can't sit, obviously my educational goals are going to be impacted. So I need to work on the trunk as well as PT needs to work on the trunk, for example, for that child to be able to walk around the hallway or get around in a wheelchair, or uh -huh. a gait trainer. So um, a lot of times when we co-treat, it's because we want to kind of get more bang for our buck. We have uh -huh. four hands there and we can work together and get... Um, better motor patterns for example so if i've only got two hands and a lot of times this happens with kids that have high muscle tone or low muscle tone um i can't facilitate an optimal posture or optimal trunk position and then also get them engaged in a school-based task so together we can do it and mm -hmm. get a functional task or a school-based task aligned with how we want their body to be positioned so. sure and you can always give parents and medical people advice on like what types of things would be helpful for school yes. for wheelchairs and um, yes. that type of stuff mm -hmm. right yeah absolutely and i've done that before um we've had kids that we need uh activity chairs for um for positioning uh different desks things like that and a lot of times pt and ot collaborate on those as well mm -hmm. uh, and we've also helped with things like we'll help with sensory room design oftentimes Yay. so if you're <laughs> in a school setting where you're thinking about getting a sensory room i highly 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 encourage you to collaborate with your ot who has that sensory knowledge to help mm -hmm. design that because i've been in a lot of school districts and uh, it's always great. Some I've worked in the hallway, some I've had an actual room to work in, some mm -hmm. it's uh, an office, so wherever. In the corner of someone's office. <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't know who that would be. <laughs> you work where you can, <laughs> and that's fine. Um, but I've been in some sensory rooms where I'm overwhelmed and I'm a relatively normal <laughs> functioning <laughs> system. Uh, awesome. And so, you know, it works. It's best practice to collaborate with your OT to help design that because then they can serve a variety of sensory needs and not be overwhelming for your kids who are hypersensitive or underwhelming for your ones that are under responsive. So yeah, absolutely. Whole other side note. So in general, I know we've talked about this before that we feel like, um, with kids having so much screen time, even at preschool, <laughs> that our fine motor yes. skills, are, we're seeing more and more mm -hmm. fine motor delays yes. in kids coming to kindergarten. So what tips do you have that, <laughs> I'm stuck in the corner every Tuesday, Patty. Um, <laughs> Um, so what tips do you have for primary teachers that if you just notice that you have a lot of students that seem to be behind in fine motor, what could they be doing like on a daily basis? Um, so some great activities and part of what we're seeing. So Jenny talked about the screen time. The other thing we're seeing is um, it starts down at the infant level in terms of not getting enough tummy time and not getting enough time on their um, hands and knees because when they're weight bearing through their hands, it's promoting all that musculature in the hand and that tone development and muscle development. Um, so a lot of times we're seeing kids who didn't hit those milestones or they went straight to walking and didn't crawl and later on there's coordination and uh, fine motor issues. But some things teachers can do, doing things like hiding things in putty or Play-Doh and having them dig them out, find any sort of fine motor manipulative buttons, coloring is a great activity. It not only promotes fine motor skills, but it also promotes visual motor, eye hand coordination skills, as well as pre-writing. Well, and so, do you, I think sometimes people are like, oh, they're just coloring. <laughs> yes. You know? And there's so much more to it than that. <laughs> um, so one of the things, I took handwriting without tears when I was first starting in school-based practice because I knew I'd be working on handwriting a lot. And one of the things I learned 
was if a picture is more vertical, a child's going to color up and down. And if it's horizontal, side to side. And if it has any sort of diagonal objects in it, they'll color diagonally. So it facilitates those pre-writing strokes that they need for handwriting. Huh. So even if you have a kid who is all writing, already writing, but doesn't have the best letter formation, it can continue to strengthen those skills. I did not know uh, that. Yeah. I learned something new. <laughs> there you go. Uh, anything, really. I like using tweezers and tongs quite a bit to not mm -hmm. only facilitate grasp, but that control, that graded control with their fingers. So how can they incorporate this in their normal day? Like, does, could this be centers or jerk for indoor recess? Or I didn't know that either. Yeah. Um, yeah, centers. So uh, depending upon grade level, what makes sense, but... One of the things that's great in centers is if you're doing things like sorting, you can have them use tweezers or tongs to sort. Nice. Um, anything that's going to facilitate that pinch is great. You can also do, you could tie coloring activities to your learning activities in the classroom. That's what I didn't know either. <laughs> Who knows? Because I know you've taken the course too. Just a different educator. So I took mine down in Texas. So. Oh, gotcha. Um, so you can incorporate coloring activities and to your learning activities to work on those skills. Cutting's another great one. And not just cutting paper, cut cardstock, cut cardboard, because that's gonna, again, make that hand have to work harder. Um, you can grade it. So if you have a child who has weaker fine motor skills, they now have scissors that have the little thing that flips that makes them spring-loaded. Mm. Um, so it's just got a little arrow thing that flips up and then you can use that to learn the skill and then as they get it, then flip it down and it's no longer spring loaded and then they're That's doing it on their own. Cool. Yeah. So there's a lot of neat things out there. And as OTs generally in the school setting, even if we don't have a child on our caseload that's in your classroom, now don't get me wrong, OTs tend to have, especially in larger public schools, large caseloads, but they're usually willing to help problem solve or come up with some activities. For sure. So. For sure. Betsy said the Dollar Tree has larger tweezers in the school section and tongs in the kitchen section that are good too. Cool. So this is an easy way to make it affordable and not have to spend a bunch of money. Okay. So. And for parents, what yeah. kinds of tips do you have for parents? For parents, um, definitely limit screen time is a big one. And that's one I struggle with as a parent. It's so easy sometimes when the day's busy and I need five minutes here, buddy, have your tablet. Um, Legos, I use those and that's mm -hmm. another one you can use in the school too. I, Isaac, I'm thinking my own kids as I'm thinking through this. Isaac loves Legos. So that's a big thing I do to promote his fine motor skills. He loves Play-Doh. So a lot of those kinds of activities at home. Also, chores. <laughs> They'll love me for saying this. Yes. Chores are great things to do too because it just facilitates strengthening throughout the body. Mm -hmm. Whether it be carrying in groceries, helping vacuum. Um, and it's teaching daily life skills that they're going to need right, as well. So. Right. Give them kids a Swiffer. <laughs> <laughs> Mine would be excited with that. He's all about playing house right now. So Awesome. Okay. So as far as, um, as far as parents go as well, like when should a parent, like when, when's that point where you should be concerned? Like, you know how all parents are paranoid mm -hmm. that something's going to be wrong. Yes. And so at what point should you really be concerned and maybe talk to a doctor or professional about a referral? Obviously, it really depends upon the age. Um, so whenever you have a concern, I would talk to the doctor. The big thing that I think is hard for parents is recognizing that development is a, what's considered normal is a span, like it's mm -hmm. a spectrum. So you have from the low end of average to the high end of average. And so I've actually been just teaching this in class, but 16th percentile is the cutoff for the low end of average. Yes. And then it's 84th, if I remember correctly, for right. high end. So when I'm in a case conference with a parent and I say your child scored 25th percentile in fine motor skills, as a parent, we go, oh, that's so low. Well, no, it's not. It's on the lower end of average, but it's still what's considered typical for a child their age. So you have to first recognize that children develop at different rates um, and at different times. So it's okay for your child to not be, um, you know, 60, 70th, 80th percentile. The mm -hmm. 25th is still okay and they'll get there. And mm -hmm. there's some th those activities we talked about you can do to help promote uh, their development. So that's one thing I would definitely say because I know that that's hard for parents to hear that their child's 
that lower percentile and then they're not qualifying for services. Well, what do you mean my child's 25th percentile and they're not qualifying? Um, and it's just because they're on the low end of average and that's okay. That's like the shapes I was talking about earlier that, you know, four to six years of age. Well, some four year, four year olds can draw a triangle. Some six year olds can't. That's still all right. Mm-hmm. That's still considered. Yeah. Right. I always think about it. Like it's, it's kind of like height too. It is. So like Absolutely. your kid may be at the 26th percentile in height. That doesn't mean they're like, yes, <laughs> they're delayed. Yes. <laughs> It just means they're shorter. <laughs> so I think as a parent, definitely talking to other parents. Now, don't get, com- don't compare. Like, don't get in a whole, like, their kid's walking and my kid's not walking yeah, type competition don't do that. yet. But seeing what other kids are doing, talking to the teachers. Um, teachers definitely know. If you're seeing major deficits, then definitely. But I think really it just, it depends upon the developmental level. There's not, like, one cutoff uh-huh. just talk to your pediatrician on their um on your wellness checks or if you right. feel like you need to do something before then and I could speak to that personally um my son Isaac wasn't really talking <laughs> <laughs> my son Isaac really wasn't talking at two and a half years he'd say a few words but he was nowhere where he should be and I have the advantage of working with speech therapists so I was picking their brain they're like yeah he should be close to 200 words by age three and he wasn't there at all so I went and talked to his pediatrician and they wanted to wait till he was three. And I said, okay, I'll wait a bit longer. But if we're not hitting those skills, I'm going to come talk uh-huh. to you again. And I did. I called his pediatrician at two years and I think it was <laughs> 10 months. And I said, okay, I know the importance of early intervention. I really want to get him in and get him at least evaluated by a speech therapist and make sure that everything's okay. Sure. And it turned out he had an auditory processing issue and needed speech therapy for a few months. So uh-huh. early intervention is crucial, but just recognize Um, if you do get a referral, whether it be medical based or school based, and there's an evaluation that your child may not qualify because they may be on that low end of average, but I always encourage parents to, it's better to know than not know. Exactly. And absolutely. If you read, you know, that they should be doing this milestone by this month, give it, give it a few months. If they're not Uh doing it like six months after, Uh then I would start to worry. So absolutely. Anything else that you feel like as an OT, we should know about school-based OT? I can't remember. Did you cover the difference for what a related service is versus? Yeah. Well, we talked about that related. You have to have an IEP to get Mm -hmm. a related service. Okay. So like if, if you, if you don't have an IEP at all and you aren't, you didn't qualify for one, Mm -hmm. then we we don't provide school-based OT. So that's the biggest, I think, misconception for OT is we are related service. Um, And so therefore, if the child doesn't qualify for special education, we can't provide services, whether they, and this is unlikely, but it could happen, they score low enough on a motor assessment to qualify for OT, but they don't score low enough to qualify for an IEP. Right. Um, And then there's other things that the school can look at to determine. Um, But just remember that our goals are not, in the clinical setting, I write my own goals related to my scope of practice and what I do. But in a school-based setting as OTs, um, depending on your school setting, some OTs may be writing goals and others of the teachers will be, but the goals have to relate to education. So they have to be educational goals. So they're not as OT based Mm -hmm. as um, they would be in a clinical setting. So it might be a goal the teacher has for copying sentences off the board and that child needs handwriting support. So they're getting OT for handwriting to copy Mm -hmm. sentences. Yeah. Typically your teacher is going to be the one writing the goals, the special ed teacher, and then the OT would support Mm -hmm. those goals. And usually as an OT, I'll consult. Like if the teacher really is having a hard time, we'll talk through a goal and here's how Mm -hmm. OT can support it. I got my hair cut and it's <laughs> all driving me nuts. So, um, but yeah, so our goals look different in the school setting. And I think that's a hard mm-hmm. thing for people sometimes to wrap their mind about when they're reading an IEP. Well, they have OT, but there's not an OT goal. Well, no, because my goal mm-hmm. is to support the, the educational goals, the teacher's goals. So there right. won't be a sensory goal. It'll be attention to task. And I'm doing sensory stuff to help improve attention to task. Exactly. So that would be the one other caveat, I think. So, yeah, I think I think we just have to be careful as special education teachers that when our student does qualify for OT services, that we write a goal that the OT can work on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually had that happen I've before. I've got pretty creative <laughs> at finding ways, and your OT should, uh, finding ways to words what I'm doing works towards those goals but yes definitely Mm -hmm. if you don't know for sure what your 
um, they qualify for OT and you don't have a goal in mind, definitely talk to that OT and see how you can collaborate on the goal together. Absolutely. So. All right. Well, we thank you so yes, much absolutely. for joining thank us Thank you for tonight. joining us. And thank you, everybody, for popping on and joining the conversation. Um, but hopefully, <laughs> Betsy will get her new AirPods so she can join us <laughs> again next week when we come back. December, we are going to be going back to a behavior topic. Um, and I believe we're going to be talking. I, I don't have my notebook in front of me, but I believe we're going to start talking about functional behavioral assessments. Ooh, yes. So it's going to be a big yes, month of be. behavior, behavior. So if behavior you, always indicates a need. That's absolutely. What I so. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys, and have <laughs> a happy, you. happy Thanksgiving. Bye, everyone. Thank <laughs> Bye -bye. you.